Michelle Hohn, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I am very, very well. Thank you for asking. It's so lovely to have you here. Thank you for being here first things first. And I want to dive straight into your story and give the listeners a little bit of background about who you are, what it is that you do. Could you give us a little bit of insight into what your day-to-day looks like and how you ended up doing what you do today? So yeah, my day-to-day is I am the founder of The Fit Clinic. So The Fit Clinic is a nutrition coaching company which essentially specializes in female health. So anything from uh, body composition, performance, um, PCOS, hormonal issues like endometriosis, fertility is a big part um, that we specialize in, I suppose we'll maybe go into the, the backstory behind that shortly. Um, fertility, periods, PMS, all the things that go along with being a female essentially because we are quite complex. Um, I think a big reason, I kind of to touch on that, like a big reason that I have become like have have become really interested and specialized in this area is no offense to you Elliot but men are just not that interesting when it comes to their physiology so if you think about it from one month to the next your physiology essentially stays the exact same there's not many waves and hormonal fluctuations and mood and sex drive and energy and metabolism whereas us complex creatures are a little bit more interesting and there's lots of wavering there's lots of fluctuation so I think that's a huge part of it. Just I, I find it so interesting to work with females and work with the female physiology. So my back my background is I started off doing a BSc in sports science and then I moved straight into doing a PhD in nutrition. And really like just to kind of keep it brief because I always tend to waffle on about this, but I I, I suppose with a PhD, it's it's it was a research based PhD, so you get very much pigeonholed in one area. And I wanted to come out of my PhD feeling like I was really well rounded, so I decided to set up this Instagram page called the Fit Clinic. I don't know where the name came from, but here we are. <laughs> and the idea was to take research paper, which I suppose a lot of people can struggle to really take. What is the take home message from a research paper? I wanted to take those papers and essentially make them easy to understand on social media, like for different coaches and personal trainers and nutritionists. And that's essentially where it started. And people started contacting me, asking me to um, essentially design nutrition plans. And there was a little bit of resistance at the start because I think I just had a lot of self-limiting beliefs, to be honest. I was like, oh God, no, like it was, it was almost like an imposter syndrome type thing. And then, yeah, I remember just overnight, I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this. I put together my consultation forms. I put together a plan and here we are uh, seven years later. So I have the most incredible team. So there's a team of 12 of us. And what's amazing is we all have our own area of expertise. So we will have nutritionists who specialize in female health, female hormones, PCOS, endometriosis, PMS, fertility. And then we'll have other nutritionists who would specialize in digestive issues and people who have a really poor relationship with food. So um, we're, yeah, we're a really well-rounded team, which is amazing. So, so lucky to have such a great team. Yeah, what a journey. And it sounds like a very, very comprehensive team and a lot of different specialists for a lot of different areas, which definitely helps. And I'm particularly interested about what led you in the direction of choosing nutrition to focus on in the early stages. Obviously, it's got more specialized as the years come on. But did you start with your own health and fitness journey when you were maybe a teenager or when did that all begin for you? Yeah, well, like, to be honest, I actually, I suppose my health and fitness journey probably started when I started sports science, which was when I was about 18 or 19, and just started working out in the gym and started to get interested in nutrition. But to be totally honest, I ended up like, have actually having like a full blown eating disorder, which I feel like what's really interesting, I feel like a lot of health professionals are coming from that perspective, which is really interesting, because it means that once we have recovered, we can really put ourselves in someone else's shoes and have a lot of empathy towards someone who does come to us with a poor relationship with food. So yeah, that's essentially where my journey started. And I think that's really where my interest in nutrition became because I actually became quite obsessive about it. And thankfully then I, yeah, so it was all to do with, for me, it was all to do with aesthetics. It was all to do with how I looked and how I felt. And then I suppose my recovery like was actually really straightforward it wasn't to do with therapy or anything like that which I know can be so effective for a lot of people but for me I actually started in a crossfit gym when I was 22 and all of a sudden there was no mirrors there was no focus on body composition it was all about okay like how much can you lift versus not even the person beside you, but versus how much you could lift last week. And all of a sudden my perspective and focus shifted on me going to the gym to be like, Oh, I need to punish myself because I ate really like 
quote unquote crap over the weekend and it changed to be okay I need to eat these carbohydrates and I need to eat these foods in order for me to recover from that session so I can be stronger next week and yeah that's essentially yeah how I suppose I suppose I got into health and fitness and thankfully I've recovered and as I said thankfully um I have so much empathy and a lot of kind of working tools that I can I suppose empower clients with when it comes to um people who don't have the best relationship with food absolutely and it's amazing that CrossFit had such a therapeutic impact on you as well but I can see it and I've, I've heard of it quite a lot also powerlifting I've found that helps with a lot of people who have had that bodybuilding focus for so long and all of a sudden that switch where I actually need to eat in order to lift this weight or recover from this session it takes the yeah. emphasis off the physique massively and you'll probably know yourself going to the gym for purely aesthetic reasons it's just so exhausting and boring really like I dragged myself to the gym all those times like against my will whereas Obviously, there's sessions where I'm like not overly happy to go to these days, but the focus is just completely shifted and it's just much more positive. It's to do with not so much like now as getting strong, like obviously that is a main goal, but really for me as a now mother, it's really just about giving myself a little bit of headspace and I really do it for my sanity, to be honest, <laughs> to get stronger, yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. And I think there's a, only a certain amount of lifespan. I mean, there's different uh, situations for every single person, but I think there is a certain amount of lifespan to how much you can train purely for aesthetic reasons. I know that I ran into that wall and I think that a lot of people are fighting that battle now and I'm not surprised why a lot of people don't have the motivation to go to the gym when it's purely for those reasons uh, because it's also so temperamental as well. Like, you know, you might go to the gym super consistently, but your diet isn't in line with where it should be. And it's literally like you are go to the gym for the zero purpose, right? Whereas if you add a performance element to it, irrespective of how your nutrition is, and obviously it's not giving people permission to slack on their nutrition, but at least it gives them more rationale to go to the gym just to, instead of, yeah, purely focusing on what they look like in the mirror, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And on the note of the complex creatures that females are, I want to dive into many, many different topics that uh, will jump back and forth if I'm completely honest, but I want to get started by going through something that I hear a lot of, which is women and fasting. I think that fasting has gotten very, very popular in recent years. Maybe a little less, people are a little less vocal about it right now than they were maybe like two or three years ago, um, especially pre-pandemic. I think it was, a, it was a big, big thing. And the similar principles were applied to, okay, well, a, a man will fast and he will be getting, you know, a great amount of benefits from doing it not just from a time saving or calorie perspective but also from all these hormonal uh, standpoints that we're going to get advantages from and then those same principles we apply to a female but it almost sounds like they're very very different responses that are going to happen based on the physiology of both the two so can you go through why it might not be so beneficial to a female to fast and also the reasons why it could be for certain females yeah so I'll kind of start with a quote by, I don't know if you follow Dr. Stacey Sims. She is a nutritionist, she has a PhD. She's amazing. Like I definitely recommend following her. She's a great book as well. Um, and her quote is, I always steal this from her, but I always quote her, <laughs> is women are not small men. And basically what this means is we're not a shrunken down smaller version of the female, of the, of the male physiology. We're so much more complex than that. And she actually has done a lot of reading herself around the research in fasting and what we find is that a lot of the research around fasting has been done in men and this is the case in a you'll know yourself with a lot of research in terms of health and fitness and nutrition like even during my own phd i am i'm a woman i was i was a researcher and i was also omitting females from my research because they are complex and there's so many variables when it comes to their menstrual cycle so unfortunately when it comes to fasting and a lot of the other research women are omitted so the issue is that we're taking the research that's been done in men when it comes to fasting which is shown to have massive benefits and um, not just in terms of body composition especially in terms of cognitive um, performance as well and just kind of overall longevity and overall health and there is huge amount of benefits but we're taking this and just applying it to women when our physiology is very very different to that so it's it's just it's just a case that we actually don't know um from a research standpoint we don't know the effects of fasting in women i know anecdotally from working with clients that there are and this is not to say that all women can't fast it's what i mean is that it's it's a case that it's not a case that every woman can fast if that makes sense so 
basically like it really comes down to hormones so when you are fasting when you think about it when you wake up in the morning and you don't eat breakfast your cortisol is already at its highest first thing in the morning it's what makes us wakes us up in the morning it's what makes us alert so if you are skipping a meal on top of that that's going to again release cortisol and adrenaline or stress hormones from our adrenal glands so when it comes to our female hormones, our progesterone, our estrogen, and our ability to reproduce or our ability to create our menstrual cycle, our menstrual cycle is so, so sensitive to these changes or these increases in cortisol and adrenaline. So if we are continuously kind of in this, like, you know yourself, the kind of um, a sympathetic as opposed to a parasympathetic nervous system state so we have our two nervous system state we have our sympathetic which is kind of our fight or flight response and then we have our parasympathetic which is kind of like our rest or digest it's when we're chilled out it's when we're doing meditation it's when we're breathing we're supposed to be in our parasympathetic state most of the time we the reason that we have our sympathetic um sympathetic nervous system is to prepare us to run from a predator to prepare us to run from danger But unfortunately, we are continuously, a lot of us are chronically stressed and we're continuously in this this sympathetic nervous system, this fight or flight response state. And it's not just a case that like, I'm not just saying this is just for people who are stressed, but it's people who are just doing, doing, doing. Like I'm literally like putting my hand up here. I'm so guilty of this, but I think as well, like we won't go into it, but women are just expected to do so much. And I think we are not even that we're expected, but we place so much expectations on ourselves to do absolutely everything. You have to be, you have to be a mother, but you also have to run a business and you also have to, but, oh, you're running a business. Do you not like, do you not look after your child? And oh, you're looking after your child all the time. Do you not have aspirations to run a business? So it's so, so overwhelming and we're continuously doing 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 and we're constantly in this sympathetic nervous system state so just to kind of backtrack a little bit if we are adding fasting in on top of that which we know puts us into this kind of fight or flight response what can happen is as i said our female hormones are so so sensitive to changes in um, or especially to being chronically in this kind of high cortisol state and what can happen is it just minute it just interacts with our hormones it the big thing is that it actually interacts with our hormone progesterone so progesterone is a hormone that we create and um, that we synthesize after we ovulate so our, our menstrual cycle is split up into two different phases our follicular phase which is before ovulation and our luteal phase which is after ovulation and in our luteal phase and um, after ovulation that's when our progesterone is at its highest and progesterone is a really really great hormone it's amazing we love progesterone it's our zen hormone it has anti-anxiety effects it makes us chilled out it also makes us a little bit more introverted so women will notice when they get into more in tune with their cycle that they feel more introverted they just kind of want to they don't want to socialize as much like kind of in their luteal phase after ovulation especially coming up to, towards their towards their period so it's an anti-anxiety kind of introverted chill out hormone but the interesting thing is that cortisol and progesterone actually compete for each other so if we're continuously pushing out cortisol low level cortisol all of the time it takes from our progesterone so all of a sudden when we don't make enough progesterone that's when we start to really really suffer from pms so this is a huge thing so any clients who come to me who or come to us who have really bad pms the first thing i'm going to look at is their stress and it's the last thing that people want to look at because they're like what supplement do i need to take what nutrition plan do i need to follow i'm like you need to just calm down you need to stop doing everything and this is essentially what fasting feeds into if if fasting is going to produce cortisol it's it's therefore going to kind of rob us of progesterone therefore we're going to get like bad pms or sore boobs or cramps or migraines we're feeling really really low really emotional crying for four or five days before before our periods and like what's really interesting is you'll notice that if if a woman kind of gets more in tune with her cycle and starts to track like i noticed last month for like to be totally honest last month i was just dead i was so lethargic i was so emotional i felt like my life was falling apart but if I looked back on the month that I'd had, I'd had such a stressful month. I was skipping meals, not intentionally, just wasn't making time to eat. I was overdoing it in the gym and just trying to do so, so much wasn't on top of my sleep. So my point is when you start to get more in tune and understand how these changes and fluctuations impact, or sorry, changes in cortisol and things that we do impact our hormones, you start to realize, okay, I feel like this because I wasn't looking after myself this month. Now I need to just 
cop on <laughs> and stop skipping breakfast and stop skipping meals and grabbing something here and there like focus on my supplements focus on my sleep and maybe pair it back a little bit with training and maybe pair it back a little bit with fasting so that's yeah a really really long-winded way of answering your question around fasting and females and again like just to kind of say as you alluded to earlier on it's not a case that like nobody can fast if you're a woman you can't fast but it's a case of looking at all of your stressors so if you're waking up first thing in the morning you're having coffee so caffeine again is a stimulant it's going to release cortisol and adrenaline if you're going to the gym fasted you're doing a session like yes a training session is going to clear your head but at the same time when you know yourself from from, from your work when you apply progressive overload to a training program it's a stress you're trying to stress your body out in order for it to adapt and get stronger and get faster and grow but essentially it is a stress so if you're waking up first thing in the morning cortisol is high you're drinking your coffee and that's your stimulant you're fasting and then you're going to the gym and then at the end of the month you have really bad pms that's the reason because you're not you're doing too like you're just doing too much so it's a case of looking at everything so maybe you can fast if your nutrition is on point for the rest of the day maybe you're not consuming much caffeine and you're on top of your sleep your training like is is sufficient but it's not too much and obviously you don't have any psychological stressors then okay maybe you can fast but if there's no hard and fast rules i find when it comes to females there's some women that can completely get away with fasting and have perfect periods and go on to have no fertility issues whatsoever and then there's other women who once we cut out, cut out fasting we realize how detrimental it had been to their health and things start to work more efficiently i think the female that you described with minimal psychological stress and not so much going on and wasn't you know going to the gym in the morning wasn't suffering with low sleep it's probably like one percent of women right so exactly. i think the yeah the hard and fast rule for i think for most people would just be to reflect on whether it is advantageous or not so i can imagine a lot of people will be starting to second guess whether that's the right choice for them now and let's say there's a woman who says actually it's, it helps me a lot with my calorie management and mm -hmm. ultimately i'm going to continue with it what tips would you give them obviously you mentioned uh maybe scaling back a little bit on the training uh, reducing the caffeine they're having in the morning any other key tips for women who are going to choose to fast who maybe wouldn't be the best candidates for it um, I would just say as well, making sure your nutrition is on point for the rest of the day, like making sure you're getting in your meals and your snacks, you're managing your blood sugars, you're eating sufficient protein so that especially if you're training, you're, you can recover from those training sessions. Then as well, like one supplement that I find can really, really help is magnesium. So magnesium is essentially like, I call it like nature's tranquilizer. It chills us out, it makes us zen. So I find that can be really, really good, especially for anyone who's kind of a little bit stressed a little bit anxious that's brilliant and definitely like on top of your sleep like if you're not getting eight hours sleep you shouldn't be waking up and then not eating breakfast until like noon um i would definitely say that those those two should th that, that sleep in particular should definitely be considered i've never considered it before but would there be rationale potentially to fast on the days that you don't train and if you're going to be training fasted then well typically going to be training fast maybe you opt to have a meal on those days and then just stick to fasting on the days that you rest yeah that's actually yeah, a really really good idea like, and you'll notice or i will like i know i notice and definitely with clients is that if you wake up and you do have caffeine and you do fast and you do go to the gym and you come home and you don't have food straight away i'm literally shaking like my body is like the dictionary definition of fight or flight so it's just about realizing that like how can that be good for your body really when you think about it so yeah that is actually a good idea like fast on days where you don't exercise um, that, and that and like i think it's important for women to know as well like there, there's a small amount of research to show that maybe fasting confers this benefit that isn't to do with calories when it comes to weight loss but for the most part the reason you know yourself the reason fasting works from a body composition perspective is you simply don't eat as many calories in a given day so if we can try and like if fasting isn't for you there's still ways and means of of managing your calorie intake without having fasting Mm, one final question on fasting just whilst we're here it just came to my mind right now is that would there be benefits to reversing the hours that you fast so rather than waking up and fasting in the morning would there be more benefits to maybe having an earlier dinner and then fasting through the night yeah that's actually that's actually a really really good suggestion i don't think we have the research well we definitely don't have the female research on it but from a cortisol perspective it definitely does make sense so as i said it, your cortisol is at its highest first thing in the morning so yeah it actually does like if you like the first thing 
if you have breakfast, if there's carbohydrates and it's just a, like especially and if it's a well-balanced meal, it brings us our cortisol, not even back to baseline, but it just kind of suppresses a little bit so it's not completely ramped up like for the whole morning. So yeah, that's actually a good suggestion to um to have breakfast in the morning and maybe have like an early enough dinner and then finish it there and then go again um the following day. Mm, yeah, I think it might fall in line with less psychological stresses as well i mean don't get me wrong the only time that most of us can think about our psychological stresses is that time at night but maybe there's a little less on your agenda in the evening i'm keeping yeah. my fingers crossed anyway but coming into the nutrition side of things you mentioned that was vital to stay on top of and i feel that we am noticing especially with females if i'm completely honest based on my client base i will hear the occasional man tell me about you know the dairy intolerance the gluten intolerance etc but it's almost like one in two females if i'm completely honest so why are they so prevalent at this moment moment in time especially uh, with the females that I'm working with and the females I just experience in day-to-day life so I think a big thing like I think it's massively overemphasized to be honest so we kind of have this especially like some nutritionists will just have this idea that no matter what you come to, whatever whenever, no matter what a client comes to them with um whether it's PCOS or PMS or um weight loss issues they'll just like oh let's just cut out gluten and dairy right so when you cut out gluten and dairy you know yourself if you've ever done this before you can't deprocess food there's there's no processed food that you can really eat that doesn't have some form of gluten or dairy in it and all of a sudden this is a whole category cut out and therefore what we end up doing is just essentially really improving our diet and improving our nutrient profile and eating more vegetables and eating more fruit and eating more proteins and inevitably we do feel better so i always wonder is it really the gluten and dairy that's actually the culprit or is it the processed foods? And one thing I would say is like, I would never, like if if a client came to to, to us, I would never say, okay, you can't eat X foods, you can't eat processed foods. I think like we're very, very much about moderation. We're very much about incorporating a nutrition plan into someone's life as opposed to a nutrition plan taking control of someone's life. But I think um, the other thing when it comes to gluten and dairy is that I think we all have a tolerance level for it. I don't think that a lot of us are completely intolerant to dairy or gluten, but I think that we're eating a lot of it at frequent periods throughout the day. So I think that if we were just to actually, I find with clients, if we just pair back and find, okay, what is your actual tolerance level for this? They actually feel so much better. And then the other thing that kind of, um, it's almost like confirmation bias in a way, what happens, like you'll know yourself again, if you've ever cut out dairy for say like six weeks, completely cold turkey and then you go and try to reintroduce it again you will be really really sick and the reason for that is because you have we have our lactase enzyme which breaks down our milk sugar called lactose and our body's very smart if it realizes god she's not eating dairy why am i wasting energy making this random enzyme lactase she doesn't need it our body stops making that that enzyme and therefore we we can actually make ourselves lactose intolerant we can make ourselves not i suppose stop making that that enzyme so you will feel like a lot of people will cut it for six weeks and then go back like have a cream cake when they're out at a party or whatever it is or have some have a milkshake and they will be so sick but that's not saying that they were they're a hundred percent natively or organically intolerant to dairy. It's just a case that they've actually made themselves dairy intolerant. Um so like there is, to be totally honest, there there we do have a couple of clients that like we don't that don't eat dairy or they don't eat gluten. It's rare that it's a case that they don't eat both, mainly because it's so, so restrictive. But for the most part, of our, a lot of our clients just have found their tolerance level for what works for them, what they can manage like with no digestive symptoms and just still feel really, really good. I couldn't agree more. And what you mentioned regarding the minimizing of processed foods and the increase in the nutrient profile of the foods we are consuming reminds me of the whole argument around vegan from a health standpoint as well. It's very, very similar. It's like all of a sudden, yes, you can go down the route of vegan junk food, but quite often there is a higher intake in the amount of vegetables they're having and there's a minimization of the amount of uh, processed meats that they're having, right? So all of a sudden the health improves. And I mean, from an ethical standpoint, completely you know, down to your personal preference, but I would always question like maybe just being conscious about 
the type of eat you, meat you consume and also just diversifying, you might find the same. And same with what you said regarding the poisons in the dose. And quite often we do have tolerances, myself included. And I found that I was extremely sensitive off the back of a diet and just generally down to the calories that I had and minimized the amount I did. And then all of a sudden, and the thing is when you reintroduce dairy, it's never like, oh, I'm just gonna have a little bit of uh, milk back in my Americano. It is like you said, the milkshake, the pizza. And then all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> like dairy is like, it's never just the small amount. So no, I can definitely relate to that as well. So would you say in your experience, if someone has come to you, would you encourage them to, if they wanted to keep them in their life and try to get in a place where their digestion is super optimal, would you encourage most people to keep them in? I would, yeah. And it's about like working, like like look, working with the gut and seeing, okay, what kind of, there's some sort of an insufficiency there if you were struggling. Like there's a lot of emphasis placed on um, food intolerance tests, which there is no scientific basis behind a food intolerance test. So very often a food intolerance test will just like a finger prick one will show you the foods that you eat most frequently so always eggs dairy and gluten and people are like oh i have to cut these three things out and i feel amazing of course you do because you're eating more vegetables and so the easiest thing to do like that isn't going to cost you whatever 100 euro on a food intolerance test is do a five-day food diary and just say okay i had breakfast i had this i felt fine i had lunch i had this i had diarrhea i had i had bloating i had pains i had wind so very, very quickly, you'll be able to see, okay, it's, it's these foods, it's this food group. And then what we often do is we look to maybe eliminate, if not minimize it. And then the most important thing is to get to the root of the problem. Like why is, why is it that this person, this client is able to digest broccoli and I'm not, there's some sort of a, an insufficiency going on. So could it be a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Could it be a case that it's just dysbiosis where we just don't have enough of the beneficial bacteria in order to break down our food? Could it be that we're not eating sufficient fiber? Could it be low stomach acid? So I always find like a lot of nutritionists will just cut out a food and be like, you can have that food anymore. But no, it's everyone should be able to eat similar enough foods. Like obviously there is, there is outliers to that. But there, as I said, there's a reason that I can digest broccoli at this time, moment in time, but you can't. So what is going on in your gut that's, in a, that's kind of prohibiting you from digest from digesting that so our job is to get in and be like okay treat the root what what is that reason and fix it and then reintroduce that food it's very interesting it almost seems like the easier way out is just be like yeah take some time off dairy or never eat it again it's so difficult like if you go to a restaurant like if you're if you're on like say a low FODMAP diet because of your digestive issues, like FODMAPs are absolutely everywhere. So if we do have someone on a low FODMAP diet, it's only temporary while we get in and fix what's actually going on at the root. And then we start to very like slowly phase and reintroduce those foods in. And as you mentioned, and as we've kind of discussed, it seems like an easy route to go low FODMAP or to cut out dairy products, to cut out wheat products or gluten. But then you are pretty much asking for an eating disorder thereafter due to the amount of restriction you're placing on yourself, right? And it's just like food shouldn't be that stressful. It shouldn't True. be able to go out to a restaurant and pick up the menu and be like, oh, that sounds nice. And then continue to enjoy your time with your friends or your family. And like, I suppose coming from a perspective where I had the opposite of that, where it literally consumed every thought in my mind, it's so liberating to, to reach a point where food is just food. It's just there for enjoyment. Um, sometimes we totally own it's actually an inconvenience because I'm like, oh, I have to remember to eat. But it is so it's just so liberating to, to to reach that point and on that front we've touched on the menstrual cycles slightly um and i'm sure that we could do an entire podcast on the complexity of that as well but one of the favorite quotes that i heard a while back and i think it was on the last uh woman's health special we did on this podcast it was that your menstrual cycle is essentially your monthly report card and you kind of alluded to that earlier in terms of the bloating that you might experience, the roller coaster of emotions, etc. So if you are a female who's experiencing some major symptoms around their menstrual cycle, aside from maybe looking into their levels of stress, but I think that that's probably worth touching on again, whatever advice do you have for minimizing the impact it has full stop and also on someone's health and fitness journey as well? Because I find that we have three weeks or so of solid journey and then there's an interruption then there's getting back on track and then by the third or fourth month of that happening it can get a bit disheartening with oh cycles coming around it might cause some interruption so can you give us some context on that 
Yeah, so like uh, the first place I would always start is nutrition. So look at how how are you, I suppose, eating? How are you, how balanced are your meals? So first thing in the morning, are you waking up and having cornflakes and low fat milk, which you know yourself, it's gonna cause an increase in your blood sugar and increase in your insulin. This isn't gonna be beneficial for our female hormones. Again, it's gonna cause stress, it's gonna mess with our female hormones. So then what happens is you get tired, you get lethargic, and your, as your blood sugar drops, you kind of crave something else that's kind of sweet, a quick fix. So really looking at managing our blood sugars, how are we, how are we building our meals? So if instead we were to add nuts and seeds like fiber from our berries and maybe some like greek yogurt like your protein all of a sudden that meal looks completely more balanced lots more nutrients in it and most importantly it doesn't cause this massive increase in our blood sugar so if we like really look at our meals before we like as we plan our meals look at the balance so is there a little bit of carbohydrate a little bit of fats a good source of protein and some fiber and some micronutrients in there like always look at color when it comes to your meals as well because that's how you know you're getting nutrients in so balancing our plate or balancing our, our meals is a big one and um, the other one is looking at making sure that we're having our greens so like our leafy greens like our kale and our spinach and our broccoli so these particular these particular vegetables contain a phytonutrient called dim so dim is this amazing compound that essentially binds to um because we have and have like good and bad estrogens in our body we have our good estrogen that we make ourselves and then we have what we call our exogenous estrogens which come from our own environment what we what the air that we breathe in like not like drinking from plastic bottles drinking from plastic tupperware and um, the, the tan the makeup the soap that we lather on our skin they are all um what we call endocrine disruptors so endocrine means hormone so and a kind of a hormone disruptor. So what they do, these exogenous estrogens, is they get in and they mimic our own estrogen and they tend to kind of wreak havoc and um, give us PMS and hormonal issues. So it's back to this kind of dim compound. What this does is it binds to those bad estrogens and actually um, moves them out of our body through our stool. So this kind of brings us on to like, obviously making sure that you have your leafy greens, but then that brings us on to gut health. So making sure that you're having at least one regular bowel movement a day so that you can actually rid your body of of those um of those kind of bad hormones i kind of i hate saying bad hormones but you know what i mean those not favorable kind of metabolites of estrogen that's kind of what i would call them and yeah so making sure you're getting in all of your fiber your whole grains your different fruit and veg so that you are regular and um, another thing is water so a lot of people will look at fiber when it comes to constipation and they'll be eating plenty of fiber but we need to complement that with adding in water otherwise our I suppose it's, it's kind of what keeps our stool loose so it's really important to make sure that we're adequately hydrated as well so those would really be the the nutrition side of things and then from a supplementation perspective again it kind of bringing it back to magnesium so magnesium really like slows down our central nervous system and just it's like a, a hug essentially and like a hug in a glass that so we have this magnesium that we use and it's absolutely amazing and um, that actually has another an amino acid called L-theanine in it so L-theanine has a really really calming effect again on our central nervous system it's great for anyone who has a racing mind so supplements like that can really just um just kind of prevent us from from prevent our central nervous system from constantly being in that um sympathetic fight or flight response mode and um, so they they would be the main things and then from a lifestyle perspective it's um, it's looking at okay maybe you can't manage the stresses that you're under maybe there's no way of getting away from them but what are your stress reduction strategies and I say to so many women like how are you looking after yourself and they're like what <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing for yourself like we're doing so much for other people and we're yes we might be doing so much for ourselves from I'm um, taking our supplements eating the right food going to the gym like legging it here there and everywhere but like when are we actually like sitting with ourselves and actually just being present and taking a moment and stopping from this go 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 like hustle grind <laughs> um so that that generally looks different to everyone like for me it's yin yoga it's cacao ceremonies it's breath work like it's really just sitting with myself like there's there's times where like it well it'll be a full week before i've actually stopped and checked in with myself to be like okay how are you actually how are you doing and 
there's so many women who just go through months on end where they don't check in with themselves and um, so yeah that's that's my kind of that's how I look after myself and um, for other people it might be I like love going for a walk in nature like especially barefoot and like grounding your feet and just being present and um, especially like on the sand like along the beach I know I sound like a total hippie now but anyway <laughs> but for other people that might be listening to a podcast it might be like listening to their favorite album it might be having a bath I'm not a bath person but that is for other people so it's really just about like how do you actually look after yourself because nutrition supplementation and high intensity interval training isn't looking after yourself it is it is in a way but like are you actually checking in with yourself and and becoming in tune with your emotions and just sitting with yourself really and that's how we kind of we move back into we pull ourselves back into this parasympathetic nervous system state and just chill out and that's all that's going to do is help our female hormones and i love that you're the person saying this as well it would be very easy for a hippie with zero responsibilities and no business no children to tell you all those things but the fact is you're coming from someone who does run a business who is a mum, who ha is looking after their health and wellness so i think it's super important that you're projecting that message and genuinely saying that i do my best to check in with myself sometimes i'm not always able to do it as frequently as i'd like to but ultimately this is what i'm doing to optimize my health and my wellness yeah absolutely yeah i think so many of us just go through life on autopilot like just doing mm. things when we don't actually check in with ourselves and sit with ourselves and actually be present because if you don't do that life just literally just bypasses you and you're like whoa like how did how did those years just go by so fast so I think it's so important that I think because I suppose because we live in this culture where it's just you're rewarded and you're gratified for doing everything it's so easy to just not actually sit down and just calm and I always think as well meditation or breath work or just sitting in a room and being silent is one of the most productive things you can do because I think a lot of people who are so productive are like oh that's a waste of time I don't have time I don't have five minutes I'm like if you don't have five minutes then taking this five minutes is the most productive thing that you can do in a given day and you'll notice that when you start doing these things you actually are more productive with the rest of your doing energy if that makes sense 100%. I usually say to those people who don't have five minutes, I'm like, if you really don't have five minutes, we really like need 10. to reflect. And yeah, yeah, eight, well, yeah, exactly. Take yeah. 10 or like really look at what you're doing your days because of, I, I feel for you, honestly, I really yeah. feel for you because yeah. that's, that's something that's going to not be able to be sustained long term. So no, I couldn't agree more on that front. But a quite a common prescription um, for menstrual cycle challenges tends to be the pill, which is a very, very interesting solution to a very complex problem. And in some ways I can see the temptation of women going to their GP, um, putting their trust in the person who has been seeing them maybe since they were a girl or a boy, you know, you usually have a good relationship with your GP for years and years and you build a certain level of trust as well. And if you are someone who is go, 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 which the majority of us are in this, um, 21st century world that we live in the temptation to just take what the doctor prescribes is going to probably be the most likely outcome so can you let us into why it's a bad idea to take the pill prescription why it's being prescribed especially by someone who is such a trusted figure and yeah just everything around that because i know you are very vocal on this point yeah where do i start okay so <laughs> <laughs> kind of worms sorry yeah, so i suppose a lot of clients will come to us um with maybe I suppose so yeah I'll kind of start I'll start from the start so a lot of clients will come to us maybe in their late 20s early 30s late 30s looking to get pregnant who've been on the pill for a really long time and they might have been on the put on the pill because if it was so one thing I kind of do want to make clear is I have absolutely nothing against the pill the pill is an amazing amazing contraception if you don't want to get pregnant it's brilliant my issue with the pill is that people are taking it for the wrong reasons. So people will be taking it, they might've been prescribed it years ago for, um, for hormonal acne. It's a really good temporary treatment for hormonal acne. Um, really bad period pains, potentially endometriosis, PCOS. And yes, it manages, manages their symptoms at that period of time. But eventually when they come off the pill, all they've done is masked that issue and it's kind of like putting like a plaster over a bullet wound like you're not actually the way i always describe it as well is like if you go to the gp and they or your yeah your doctor 
and you say I have really really bad PMS or I have PCOS and I have cystic acne I have facial hair I'm I've in a regular cycle I'm not getting my period all of these different reasons that you go on the pill going on the pill for those reasons is like walking into your kitchen noticing that it's flooding and instead of turning off the tap picking up a mop and just mopping the floor over and over again whereas what we do like nutrition supplementation and lifestyle modifications is walking in and turning off the tap like that's the sensible thing to do it's not always the most straightforward thing to do of course it's more straightforward to just take a pill every day but the issue is it's a temporary fix and when these women ultimately want to come off the pill for various reasons maybe they want to get pregnant maybe it's other reasons they have the nearly the exact same issues very often that they had 10 years previous and especially with like our fertility clients when a fertility client comes to us they want to be pregnant yesterday they don't want to be pregnant in x amount of months but they don't have maybe they went on the pill because they didn't have a period or they had pcos and they had irregular cycles and instead of getting them pregnant being quite straightforward we have to unravel everything that's been masked over the 10 or 15 years that they were on the pill so that's what the issue is it's just knowing that you're not actually treating your hormonal acne. you're not treating your irregular cycle so if someone goes if, if, if you go to the gp because you have um no cycle uh, so you've no period so that's what we call hypothalamic amenorrhea if it's been gone on for three months your aim is to get your period back when you go on the pill you're not actually getting a period you're just getting a withdrawal bleed so you, you stop making your own hormones. So it's already an issue. Hypothalamic amenorrhea is already an issue where your hormones aren't like doing what they need to do. They're, they're kind of flatlining. If you just take the pill, you're do, it's the exact same thing. You're taking in synthetic hormones, which, are st which is stopping your body from making its own hormones. You're not ovulating. You're not getting a period. You're just getting this false bleed when you take your week, um, your week break. And the reason you get a bleed is because you've stopped taking the pill and therefore you get a drop in synthetic hormones and you shed the lining of your uterus. So I think an important thing is about like educating women that you are, you're switching off your hormones when you do take the pill, um, which I don't think a lot of people are actually aware of that. They think, okay, I'm, oh yeah, I got my period back because I'm on the pill. It's like, it's not, it's not your actual physio, it's not your body doing what it physiologically is supposed to do. Like those kind of fluctuations hormones you ovulate you produce progesterone your progesterone and estrogen drop you shed the lining and the cycle starts again that's not happening so i think it's important for women to understand what is actually happening when they take the the pill every day so it's really just being prescribed because it's an easy solution to some pretty pressing problems so rather than obviously a gp doesn't have the time to do the type of things that you do and dig into a lifestyle it's kind of like what can i give them that's going to provide some form of solution even if it pushes the problem down the line it might actually provide some temporary relief is that yeah. fundamentally why it's being prescribed uh, yeah 100 percent. and i do think the gps do get a bit of a like a bad rep for this and like i don't know if it's that fair because as you said yourself they don't have the time and resources to it's so much to work with a client a client comes to us with hypothalamic amenorrhea there's so much work to do from nutrition supplementation lifestyle and managing like very very often any people who have um, what we call functional hypothalamic amenorrhea which is um, their period isn't there because of a behavioral reason. They're not eating enough, they're exercising too much, or um, their psychological stresses are all of the above. And these clients are the ones that need the most amount of support. Like, so we check in with our clients every week, but they're the ones that need so, so much support and so much handholding and so much reassurance. So it's impossible for a GP to be able to, to facilitate um, and kind of support, support a patient in that way. But I think it should be a, a it should be some sort of a referral process really like it should be okay you could it, my issue is that people aren't given the option it's like oh you, you're not getting a period so you just take the pill there's no there's no other option it should be okay you can take the pill just so you know it will switch off your hormones you won't get an authentic period when you come off the pill when you want to get pregnant you're probably going to have the same issue or here's a referral onto a nutritional therapist or a nutritionist who can help you and support you from a nutrition exercise lifestyle supplementation standpoint so it should be like it shouldn't be an us and them it shouldn't be like they're doing this they don't know what they're talking about and vice versa it should be a collaborative approach like ultimately 
I'm in this job because I want to help people. And I'm just like, I've no doubt about it. GPs are in the in their job for the exact same reason. So I think that we should just take away all of the drama and ultimately realize we all just want to help people. We're all on the same page. Um, so yeah, it's tough. And then another reason that um, a lot of people aren't aware of as well is that like GPs for hypothalamic amenorrhea are missed periods. When you don't, um, when you're not um, going through your menstrual cycle or when you're not getting a period, you're not getting that increase in estrogen and estrogen is really really important in order to protect our bones so you'll notice that like a lot of women who now suffer from osteoporosis if you ask them they had hypothalamic amenorrhea years ago they had really, really irregular cycles so they weren't getting that bone protective effect so that's a big reason as to why gps will prescribe the pill as well because it's in order to protect someone's bones so so there is reasons it's not as simple as like gps are demons and they, they don't want the best and um, I just think that it, it should it should be a case that when someone walks when a, or like a, a, a girl or a woman walks into um, a GP's office it should be that they they leave feeling really informed and understanding the side effects understanding how the the oral contraceptive actually works and understanding what their alternatives are what their what their other options are I've never thought of such a straightforward collaborative approach or even just the avenue to education, simply. And I think both of those things could be incredibly valuable. And it seems like such a simple solution to a very complex and challenging problem. But yeah, the solution is is literally there, but it's just a case of saying, it's like you mentioned, it's not us versus them. It's, it is literally a case of like, how can we bring this together to align our common goal, which like you said, it's ultimately to help people with the challenges that they're experiencing. And on that note as well, it's interesting that you mentioned regarding contraception on the front of the pill that you are switching your hormones off, which never sounds like a, a healthy thing to do. But obviously there will be many people who want to go on the pill for contraceptive reasons outside of some of the challenges they're facing. So is there any, I hate to use this word, but any healthy version of contraception or is technically the healthiest form of contraception no contraception that impacts your hormones or yeah essentially down to just condoms or something like that yeah so like i would say the best the most kind of the horm the, the contraception that's going to have the least amount of side effects and not negatively impact your body would be non-hormonal forms of contraception and i completely understand that this isn't for everybody um like if you're if you're a teenager and you need contraception i completely understand that like logging into natural cycles and taking your body temperature every single morning that might not be the most like reliable method for contraception for you at that time so like there is there is a hundred percent a place for hormonal contraception and um, but then if you did want to look at more non like more natural or non-hormonal forms of contraception you could as i mentioned look at basal body temperature tracking so essentially how this works is when we ovulate just afterwards we get this increase in our body temperature first thing in the morning you'll notice it so there are apps like natural cycles and daisies that essentially provide you with a thermometer and also an app which is essentially an algorithm so you it'll take it like i always say as well like just be careful because it will take a couple of months for the algorithm to learn how your body works and when you ovulate and how your cycle looks so essentially what you do is you just plug in the um, your temperature first thing in the morning into this app and it will essentially give you green days and red days. So if, if you're using it for a, as a form of contraception, your red days are don't have sex on these days, your green days are green means good to go. Um, but at the beginning of it, like I'll be totally honest, it literally only gives you like like a couple of a handful of green days in a given month. So in terms of people's sex life maybe it's that's not for them either and um, the other one is obviously condoms the other one is um the other way of kind of like becoming more in tune with your cycle obviously this isn't overly reliable either but like is understanding your cervical fluids you're going to get changes in your cervical fluid depending on whether you're fertile or non-fertile so you'll notice that it goes from like a Elliot you're probably loving this conversation yeah. <laughs> you'll notice that like it goes from almost like a moisturizer lotion consistency to like raw egg white like that you can actually like hold between your fingers and it will stay stretchy and stay um stay stuck to both fingers basically and then again you start to move towards like a moisturizer consistency and then it's gone so when you are in that um 
that have that consistency where like well there is cervical, cervical fluid there those are your fertile days so those are obviously if you don't want to get pregnant those are the days to be really really careful and um, maybe like use barrier forms of contraception and then the other one um that a lot of people will tend to recommend is the um copper coil so the copper coil is non-hormonal so it's a coil that's obviously inserted into your uterus and it basically makes it inhospitable for an embryo to survive in that um in that environment I have had, yeah, very much mixed stories when it comes to the coil. Some women find it absolutely amazing. It goes in and we have to remember they still ovulate, they still make their own hormones and they still get a period, which is amazing. And they, yeah, they absolutely fly it. And then there's other women who just have really bad issues with it. It causes irregular bleeding, it causes pain, it can get lost in your uterus. So um, again, like I always just want to make people aware that there are there are risks involved and there are there are setbacks to any form of contraception but really it's about knowing your options um and understanding okay this is this might be non-hormonal but it's not going to be as effective as a hormonal contraception so yeah i always say like disclaimer don't blame me if you have any unplanned pregnancy <laughs> um, but yeah it's about empowering ourselves with with all of the um all of the different options and all of the different tools that we have Absolutely. I think you just sharing the multitude of different options that you just did might take people away from just assuming that the pill is the only way. And don't get me wrong, there seems to be the most accessible and easiest option. But at the same time, just again, just someone knowing the difference and potentially knowing that, okay, well, this form might mean that I'm not going to have a big chance of disrupting my hormones and therefore, you know, longer term health could be the difference between someone making that choice. So I think, as you mentioned, it's just about empowering people with that information and giving them the ability to have more than one choice and transitioning onto a very delicate topic now, which I know that you've spent a lot of time talking about and I've spent no time talking about it on the podcast. So I'm very much looking forward to getting your take on this is, of course, miscarriage. And I want to go through your experience on this um, and I just want to get a very well-rounded look at the miscarriage situation as a whole in terms of how many people it's impacting, why so many women are suffering in silence. I've noticed a bigger increase, fortunately, in the amount of people sharing recently. I've even had a couple of closer friends or people that I know have been sharing this, and it seems to be more prevalent than I anticipated, I understood, but maybe that's just because so many people were keeping it to themselves. So would you be open to sharing more about your experience and a miscarriage as a whole? Yes, absolutely. So, God, it was just before the pandemic so it was probably around february march of 20 my last of the years was the 2020 i've no idea it was yeah so we were fortunate to get pregnant basically straight away and i'd done kind of i felt like i'd done everything i'd i'd eaten really well i'd quit out caffeine i was eating all my fruits and veg taking my prenatal taking my coq10 and um, managing my exercise like i would always say to, to clients like when you're exercising um or when you're trying to get pregnant don't exercise like you're being chased by a bear and um, you want to try and like manage your your um your sympathetic nervous system as much as you can so i felt like i'd done everything right set up for success and um had a scan at um say i think it was seven weeks and everything was fine and then unfortunately at nine weeks I had a miscarriage so yeah I just kind of I just thought it was for me like I there's no I don't have any other option other than kind of looking at did I do something wrong and this is so so normal with women they immediately think like should I have not done this should I have not eaten this did I have too much of this so a big thing is like to understand for anyone who has suffered a miscarriage is that very often it's just a case of really, really bad luck. And um, that's a big thing. And um, for me, it was, there's no, there's absolutely no way of me knowing this, but I actually subsequently went on and looked at my thyroid health. And um, I got my thyroid examined and it turned out that I had subclinical hypothyroidism, which is basically just a fancy term for, um, I had like a low functioning thyroid, but it wasn't, it was subclinical. So it wasn't in the range where it would be like red flagged by a GP. Um, but what's really interesting, obviously, like I delved into this, um, I've delved into this a lot over the last few years, is that if you go to the GP and you don't want to get pregnant, you're not trying to conceive. Um, and your thyroid is kind of like, it's, it's a little bit off. They will say like, oh, your thyroid is absolutely fine. But if you are trying to conceive and trying to have a baby and you go to the GP and get your bloods done and your thyroid is a little bit off, 
that is detrimental for your fertility. It can result in difficulty getting pregnant and can result in miscarriage and can result in reoccurring miscarriage. And unfortunately, not to bash GPs, but actually I think it's fair, um, a lot of GPs don't know this. So I've had clients who come to us and have had a miscarriage or two miscarriages or maybe even three. Um, after three, generally in Ireland, you, there is investigation done and you can generally find out that um, that your thy thyroid is off then. But someone who comes to us who has had one or two miscarriages and I will say to them, how's your thyroid? And they say, yeah, my GP said it's fine. And I always say to everybody, when you get your bloods done, always get a printout. And they'll send on a printout of the results and it will be black and white that they have subclinical hypothyroidism. So the thyroid is a little bit off. It's not in range to be, I suppose, overt hypothyroidism, but it is absolutely detrimental for their fertility and could very, very likely have been a cause of their miscarriage. Um, so I, like, I'm quite vocal about this and really like getting the word out there because as I said, unfortunately, um, especially any, any GPs who aren't um, well-versed in female health and fertility, they don't realize that something that's slightly out of range could be so, um, could be so damaging for your fertility. So yeah, that was, that was our story really. And in a way, like I know this sounds so strange, but I'm so grateful that it happened because it really got me so, so passionate about fertility because I've been in a space where I would literally do absolutely anything to be pregnant and been in those really, really dark spaces um, and clients who come to us, I can just empathize with them so much. And yeah, I just, it's, there's no greater reward from a job satisfaction perspective than someone saying they're pregnant after having difficulties or having a miscarriage. So yeah, I'm going to get emotional, but I just love what I do. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, that, that was our story. So um, it was, it was a bit of a rocky road, but we got there in the end. Um, once I fixed the, the, um, the thyroid issue, everything was really, really straightforward. Um, we're lucky to work with a, um, an amazing consultant who specialized in thyroid health. So for me, um, there is clients who are happy to wait and manage their thyroid, like, cause there is um, things you can do to, to kind of bring it back to a normal state. But for me, I was like, I want to be pregnant yesterday. So I just went on medication. I just took the the more straightforward route that I knew was going to work within a month or two. And fortunately we got pregnant um, after I think two or three months after that. So yeah, it was in the end, it, it was quite straightforward, but it was a bit of a rocky road. No, I can imagine it's mind blowing that it came down to something and I don't want to call it simple because it's not simple, but just with that awareness that you have now and the fact that you can share it as well may cause so much yeah so it may reduce the chance of heartbreak for so many people and with such a simple solution in a way of course there's no simple solution to anything in a way but at least if you know what the problem is you can actually go about getting the right solution to it and i think that it's beautiful that you took care of your health so much to the point in which the obvious indicator was quite quite straightforward for you to point out as well which is fantastic but on the note of um mental well-being did it impact you and your partner from a mental well-being oh, standpoint because of yeah yeah please go into that for me it was so tough like really really tough i had to go to counseling over it and do you know what it was it wasn't even the law so like it was mid pan it was literally the start of the pandemic so and um, it was tough because i had to find it on my own while my husband waited in the car and i had to go and kind of share the news with him afterwards which was tough but you know what there was no getting away from processing it or the grief because we were like it was when you couldn't even go outside in Ireland. you couldn't go outside your 2k radius so i literally just had to sit at home with my feelings and I thankfully processed it like just really thoroughly over those two weeks like there was for me there was no way of getting away from it I just had to sit with those feelings so that was okay that was something that I was able to manage and handle and process the hardest part for me was being pregnant afterwards so there was just and this is so common for anyone like pregnancy after loss is honestly I would take I know it sounds so strange, but I would take the grief any day over the anxiety around um, having a pregnancy after loss. So that was really hard. And I actually ended up going to, to therapy, um, which I felt really, really helped afterwards. Um, so yeah, and like when it comes to like as a couple, I think people process grief in different ways. Um, my husband, I don't know if it's a men's thing, <laughs> gross over generalization, but he just didn't really seem to process it at all. And there was kind of a lot of anger there, whereas I didn't have any anger. It wasn't an emotion that I could even think about. It was just sadness. So that was really tough. Even like on our relationship, it was really, really hard. We'd never gone through anything like that before. Um, 
then being on social media I just literally like I'll be totally honest I just called anyone who like even had a child that alone was pregnant I just couldn't be in that space and um, so so yeah like it was really really tough and it was only when and I think like I think it, it's it's so important to normalize when it comes to someone who's struggling with fertility issues it's so important to normalize that yes you can be you can be so happy for someone who is pregnant and so happy for your best friend and want the absolute best for them but be absolutely devastated for yourself at the same time and that is something that I really struggled with as well because my best friend actually ended up getting pregnant a few weeks later and I was just like do you know what it is it I felt like the worst person in the world because not only was I managing the grief and the the envy that it's jealousy like there's no getting away from it but I was also dealing with how can I how can she be my best friend but I feel those feelings towards her even though I'm so happy for her at the same time so on top of that you're like I must be a bad person so I think it's so important and like anyone who I've spoken to who's gone through this like and any counsellors or psychologists have said like you are already going through a tough time as it is there is no need to start questioning your actual feelings you have to feel what you feel and understand that those are the feelings that you're going to feel to get you through this phase and um, so yeah like it's, it's just about normalizing it is it, it's normal to be so happy for someone else and be devastated for yourself when it comes to fertility and um, and then yeah thankfully I suppose we were getting scans left right and center but I think we got a scan at 16 weeks and I finally started to be like okay I think we're going to be okay so so yeah it was a happy ending in the end and to be honest it was like from a personal growth perspective it was just so necessary and um, I do feel like a very very different person like this side of things and it's just become a huge part of my job and my passion so in a way I'm so happy that it did happen. It's amazing that that's the perspective you have on it and I'm incredibly happy that it has been a happy ending for you as well it's <laughs> yeah it can't be easy for anyone and I love that you're flying the flag and making people aware of these things now it's absolutely incredible and on that note if we could get some quick takeaways on anyone who is looking to get pregnant soon do you have any fertility tips that you would give to both men and women who are potentially looking to conceive in the near future yeah so one thing that a lot of people aren't aware of is that we I, my saying is it takes 12 months to make a baby so that sounds quite unusual for some people because obviously they know that it takes nine months but we have a window of opportunity prior to conception from a male and from a female perspective where we can really optimize the health of the egg and the health of the sperm so when it comes to egg health in particular we know that egg health declines with age unfortunately but we really have this window. It's generally like kind of 100 to 120, so like three to four months, um, 100, 100 to 120 days, so three to four months prior to ovulation where your eggs go through this like sprint to maturity where they grow and grow and grow and they're really susceptible to oxidative damage and um, the negative effects of inflammation. So if we can just like wrap our eggs in a safety blanket as much as we can, then what we can do is really help the, their, their health and their quality. And um, so there is lots that you can do from like a nutrition, supplementation, lifestyle standpoint. So I won't like delve into them, but like really like the, the take home, even from, sorry, from sperm, just to backtrack a little bit, they go through a really similar maturation process. So like their synthesis generally takes two to three months. And um, so again, um, from a sperm perspective, from a male perspective, they can do so much kind of three, two to three months prior to conception to really optimize the health of the sperm and therefore optimize the health of the pregnancy. So from from both sides really and um, the the main thing is really like a mediterranean style diet is what's been shown in research time and time again to to be beneficial for um, female and male fertility so like as much fruit and veg and color and antioxidants as you can because remember antioxidants are going to prevent um oxidative damage to the egg and the sperm um and then the other thing is your omega-3 fatty acids so again these have been shown in research to be beneficial for um for sperm health for um subsequent pregnancy as well so really important for, for men and women so if you don't eat oily fish so your salmon your mackerel your anchovies your sardines and your herring and um, it's best to supplement with a high quality um omega-3 because remember these have like anti-inflammatory um properties so again we want to protect the egg and the sperm from inflammation and what else um there's loads of can barely think of them but yeah a high quality prenatal is another one and i would always say a prenatal is not just for a woman it's also for men so 
uh, it's so so important that men have a prenatal as well specifically one that contains um methyl folate like also known as um your vitamin b9 which we know is really important to prevent the instance of neurotube defects like spina bifida so i would always look for um high quality prenatal and one that contains methyl folate instead of folic acid so not to kind of go through the, the gauntlet um, or the long story, but basically folic acid is a synthetic version, whereas methyl folate is like an active, more natural version of um, vitamin B9. So it means that it's highly absorbable um, and usable by our body. So you're taking it in, in its already usable form. And um, the other one would be managing your exercise. So if you're a woman, like obviously remembering that stress or sorry, exercise is going to act as a stressor on our body. So yeah, don't exercise like you're being chased by a bear when you're trying to conceive. Um, that's a big one. And same for men, just managing your stressors, managing your psychological stressors. Um, the other one that I forgot to mention as well, specifically for um, parents or women or women and men who are over the age of 35. So uh, that's it's really important for anyone who's an older couple. So over the age of 35, that they're supplementing with CoQ10. So CoQ10 is an antioxidant that's been shown to be really beneficial for egg and for sperm health. So our CoQ10 levels naturally decline with age, specifically after the age of 35. So it's important to get that in and your environmental kind of toxins. So making sure that you're kind of staying away from your plastic bottles, your plastic Tupperware, like managing like what you're lathering on your skin, that kind of thing. And um, just making like smart swaps where you can like make sure you're drinking stainless steel um, bottles, stainless steel coffee cups and that kind of thing. So the chemicals aren't leaching into, into the fluid. And um, for men, a big one is like kind of staying cool down there so like not wearing like really like tight fitting like nylon boxers and stuff like that so obviously um sperm is going to like flourish at a slightly lower temperature so making sure they're they're kind of not sitting for long periods of time make sure they're not like doing too many sauna steam rooms and that kind of thing um and yeah i think that's it well, that's a good checklist i'm gonna put that all down on the google drive and when the time yeah. comes i'll be taking all the boxes <laughs> but no it sounds like there's a lot of practical steps that we can take and i think fundamentally it comes down to just optimizing your health first and then adding all these things on top and then hoping for the best thereafter. I think, as you mentioned, a lot of it's going to be down to a little bit of luck, but I think you increase your probability of that massively by doing all those things. So thank you so much for sharing both of those aspects, both the, the loss and the ability for us to conceive in such an optimal manner as well. And Michelle, this has been an incredible conversation. I feel like we've taken so many practical things away from today. So just one final question for you is where can people find you? Where can people work with you if they want to? Where's the best place to follow more about what you do? Yeah, so we are The Fit Clinic on Instagram and thefitclinic.e on, yeah, website. So that's our website. Perfect. I'll put it all in the show notes, but thank you so much for today. It's been an incredible conversation. Thank you so much, Ali. It was great to chat.